Good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, we'll be reading verses 12 and 13. And if you didn't bring a Bible with you, you'll find Bibles in the chair pockets around you. Philippians 2, starting in verse 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the song we sung earlier to remind us that you are the God of angel armies. As Alex prayed in his prayer, we are living in troubling times. And yet, Father, none of this has taken you by surprise. And you are still the God of angel armies. And so we not, need not fear as others fear. Father, I pray that we would place our trust in you, that we would do everything that we can do to stand for what's right, to oppose what's wrong, and that we would trust you, Lord. Father, I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for the presence of the body of Christ in the United States of America. I pray, Lord, that you would use her to bring about renewal. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move to bring revival to your church, Lord, so that the Christians who are in America would do what's right, would fight for what's right, would speak for what's right, would be unafraid to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to become a righteous people. And Father, I thank you for your word and for the way you instruct us in your word. I pray that you would teach us now. I pray, Lord, you would set a guard over my lips that I would speak those things that are right and true and that you'd be exalted among us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Becoming the kind of person who does what's right because it's in your nature to do what's right, the kind of person who doesn't do wrong because wrong no longer makes sense to you, that's the kind of character change that God moves to produce in us when we come to faith in Jesus. It's a change from the inside out so that we're able to begin taking on real righteousness. So that in thought, word, and deed, we are becoming more like Jesus. Last week, I spoke with you about the means God has provided that help facilitate that change, avenues through which we draw closer to God and through which the Holy Spirit brings transformation. Those means of spiritual growth include reading the Bible regularly, listening to sermons and going to small group studies so we can grow in our understanding of biblical teaching, spending time in prayer that's honest and sincere, worship, communion, spending time with others who are seriously trying to live for Jesus, avoiding situation in which temptation is likely to take place, and replacing old destructive habits with new healthy habits. These actions in and of themselves are not what produce character change. They are simply the means God provided through which we draw closer to Him so that the Holy Spirit can bring about that change. That's why we're told that this character change is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. The Holy Spirit is the agent of that change. That's because it's the heart that has to be changed and only God is capable of truly changing the heart. At the same time, though, you and I are not passive in the process. That's why we're instructed 
in these verses we opened up with today, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Why we're told in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, to not let sin reign in your mortal body and to not present the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. It's why we're told in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, to put off concerning your former conduct the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man. In our lives as Christians, we are called upon to make choices because our will is involved in spiritual transformation. Choices to do what we ought to do based on the counsel of God's Word instead of choices simply to do what we want to do. But as I tried to explain last week, since our want-to-dos are always stronger than our ought-to-dos, the only way we will do what we ought to do is if we truly want to do what we ought to do. We have to want to live a life that's pleasing to God, a life that's based on our trust in God, more than our trust in our own recipes for happiness. Yet perhaps this is the most difficult step of all. Because it is our heart's unwillingness to do what God tells us we ought to do that's at the very root of the problem. And as I mentioned to you last week, there's a reciprocal relationship between the heart, the mind, the flesh, and the will. Our thoughts are reflections of our heart and yet our thoughts also influence our will, our actions, and the future thoughts of the heart. The choices of our will are reflections of our heart, but also influence our heart, our actions, and the future direction of our will. Our actions are reflection of our heart, and yet at the same time, our actions influence our heart, our will, and our future actions. So often what we do is not an outcome of deliberate choice and a mere act of free will, but is more of a relenting to pressure on the will from other internal and external influences. That's why simply attempting to exercise more willpower alone doesn't work. Our hearts have become enslaved to disordered desires, and the more we follow those disordered desires, the more power they've gained over us. That's why God tells us to not present the members of our body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, to not put ourselves in situations in which we're going to be tempted to sin because eventually putting ourselves in those situations will lead to sin. Our willpower simply isn't strong enough to choose against sin when we repeatedly place ourselves in tempting situations. Let me give you an example. Before I came to White Plains, I was a teacher in a Christian school and one of the classes I taught to high school students was contemporary moral issues. In one of the semester exams, I asked the students to describe a situation in which they could see themselves being tempted to sin and then to explain how they could avoid sin in that situation. And one of the guys wrote this answer. If I were on a date with a hot girl and we were sitting in a car on some back road kissing pretty passionately and then she started trying to take off my clothes, I think I would be pretty tempted to have sex with her. In fact, I probably would have sex with her. And of course he was right. He just described a very difficult situation for a teenage boy with raging hormones. <coughs> However, he had not really answered the most important part of the question. So with my red pen, I wrote on his paper, thanks for describing one of your fantasies. However, you were supposed to tell me what steps you would have taken so you could have avoided being in that situation. The desires of the flesh would have been overwhelming in the situation that that teenage boy described and eventually the will surrenders to sin because at some point the influence of the flesh is too strong for the will to choose anything else. And the more often the will chooses sin because of the influences exerted on it, the more often it will choose sin whenever it encounters similar influences. It says those sin forms channels in the mind just like running water forms channels in the earth as it moves from points of higher elevation to points of lower elevation. And then after the water forms those channels, whenever water is released in the future, it will travel through those channels formed earlier, deepening those channels and ensuring that future releases of water 
will also flow through those same channels. In a similar way, whenever certain influences occur, triggers is the word often used, the will is drawn toward responding to those influences in the way it responded to those influences in the past. The trigger initiates an influence on the will that causes the will to follow through on the same reaction to that trigger which it chose before. And if that reaction in thought or deed was sinful, then the future reaction is also likely to be sinful. And the more those sinful thoughts or deeds are chosen, the deeper the channels become that lead the will toward those same thoughts and deeds in the future. In essence, a sinful habit has been formed. Christian psychologist Dallas Willard writes, it's easier to do what you have done than what you have not done, and especially what goes contrary to what you have done. Plus, once the will becomes enslaved to a desire, in other words, once the channel between trigger and outcome has become so deep, the mind will begin to provide rationalization for that desire. So that now you have the flesh, the will, and the mind in agreement, which all have an influence on the heart. And so long as the heart, the mind, the flesh, and the will are in agreement, sin will continue to be chosen, and spiritual transformation will not occur in that part of your life. So what this practically means is that in the areas of our lives in which the greatest bondage to sin is present, the Bible refers to these areas as strongholds, areas in which the enemy is continuing to exercise control over our lives, even though we're believers. In those strongholds, in those areas of bondage to sin, we may not even be able to will to do what God wills. So we have to simply come to God sincerely in prayer with the confession that at least we're willing to be made willing. Then acting in concert with the means of spiritual growth God's provided, as well as choices we take to change what we dwell on in our minds and choices not to place ourselves in the way of temptation, the will can gradually over time begin to change. Now at this point you may be thinking, well, why doesn't God just force us to do what's right? Why does God give us the ability to make choices at all? And of course, the answer to that question goes to the very heart of what it means to be a human being, to the very heart of God's ultimate goal for us as human beings. When God first created human beings, the Bible tells us He created us in His image and likeness with the goal of conforming us to the image of His Son and enjoying communion with God throughout eternity. Everything that happens in the Bible between Genesis and Revelation is toward the end of bringing about that reality. Well, part of what it means to have been made in the image and likeness of God for the purpose of eternal communion of agape love with God is choice. Just as God has the capacity of making moral choices that are expressions of His character, so we, having been made in His image and likeness, also have that capacity to make moral choices that are expressions of our character. To not have that capacity to make moral choice would be to diminish what it means to be a human being. And believe it or not, you value that ability to make choices more highly than you can imagine. It's one of the very first expressions of God-likeness that we see in human beings. Have you ever noticed how quickly children want to do things for themselves? To feed themselves, dress themselves, tie their shoes catch a ball, turn on the TV. That's because those are all expressions of autonomy. The beginning of the ability to make volitional choice. Parents are usually excited as they see this autonomy manifested in their child. They want to be there when their son takes his first step or when their daughter says her first word. In fact, a lot of parents have those baby books in which they record all of those first experiences children have of what it means to be a human being. And as those children grow older and as those choices become more substantial, the choices to obey or disobey, the choices to do right or do wrong, parents are pleased when their children make the choice to do right. Just as our Heavenly Father is pleased when His children make the choice to do right. However, this human capacity of the will to make moral choices, which can be exercised to choose good, 
also has the option by definition of the choice to do evil. At least two options are necessary to choice. There can be more than two options, but there must be at least two, which is why all that was needed in Eden was the choice to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the choice not to eat from the tree. That choice between those two options alone was all that was needed to test the devotion of the human heart. And regrettably, the choice made by the first man and the first woman was the choice to follow self-will instead of God's will, to act out of love for the creature more than love for the Creator. And all human beings since have manifested that same sin nature, that same self-will that is driven toward getting what self wants. From infancy on, the sin nature exposes itself as we seek to exercise our will, not so we can answer the question, what is the right thing to do, but to answer the question, how can I get my way? And as children grow and then become adults, they learn how to manipulate and how to deceive in order to get their way. Tears, anger, and the silent treatment are three forms of manipulation that many people learn as children, which they continue to employ once they become adults. The key to short-circuiting these forms of manipulation in children is not to give in to them, though many parents find it easier to give in than to experience the tantrums or the high decibel nonstop crying. So parents give in, and the children grow up and become adults who continue to use the same form of manipulation that worked for them as children. This isn't something that's usually done on the conscious level. It's a manipulative reaction that they have learned. So here's the dilemma we face in our efforts to pursue spiritual growth and experience character change. Real character change can only occur if the heart itself is changed. Because real character change isn't simply a matter of outward action, but inner attitude. But the heart is influenced by what the flesh desires, what the mind thinks about, and what the will chooses. We already come into the world with our heart genetically bent in the direction of sin, and through the influences of what our flesh desires, what our mind thinks about, and what our will chooses, the heart becomes only more inclined towards sin over time. So that the diagnosis of the human heart that God makes in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 is that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But then we become Christians. We become recipients of the promise made regarding the new covenant in Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 26. That passage reads, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life where there wasn't the power to experience real character change before, now there is the power to experience real character change. Where there wasn't the power to experience true heart change before, now there is the power to experience true heart change. In fact, God tells us He's already begun to bring about that heart change. That's why we're told we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's why we're told that we should walk in newness of life. That's why we're told that God will take the heart of stone out of us and give us a heart of flesh. That heart hardened by sin will become sensitive again. That heart that couldn't be changed will be changed. And I will put my spirit within you, God also promises, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. There's the promise of that righteousness from the inside out, that life that's like the life of Jesus, so that we can become a person who does what's right, 
because it's in our nature to do what's right and the kind of person who doesn't do wrong because wrong simply doesn't make sense anymore. But this transformation takes time. That's why in the New Testament, salvation is spoken of in three tenses. A past tense, a present tense, and a future tense. Through the, through the sufficiency of Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, we have been saved from the condemnation that sin brings. This is something already accomplished that cannot be undone. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 24, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, present tense, something already accomplished, and shall not come into judgment, future tense, but has passed from death into life, past tense, something already accomplished. This is referred to theologically as justification. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been saved. However, the Bible also speaks about a present tense salvation, that we are being saved. This is the perspective from which Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, when he tells us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. This is referred to theologically as sanctification the process by which we're being saved from the old man, from our old way of living, and are taking on the new man, adopting a new way of living. It's in this part of the salvation process that we have to make use of the means of growth that God has provided. Means that will help us change what our minds think about, what our flesh desires, and what our will chooses. And remember, there's a reciprocal relationship between the mind, the flesh, the will, and the heart so that actions in one area have an effect in the other areas. As we spend time reading the Bible regularly, listening to sermons and going to small group studies, spending time in prayer that's honest and sincere, worshiping regularly, taking communion, spending time with others who are seriously trying to live for Jesus, avoiding situations in which temptation is likely to take place, replacing old destructive habits with new healthy habits. As we do these things, the mind, the flesh, the will, and the heart gradually begin to experience change. And over time, we can begin taking on the character of Jesus. Now this isn't a process completed in this life, which is why there's a third tense of salvation. Just as we have been saved from the condemnation that sin brings, and are being saved from the domination of sin in our present lives, one day, we, when we are with Jesus, we will be saved from every vestige of sin. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God, something already accomplished through your faith in Jesus Christ. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Theologically, this future tense of salvation, when sin will no longer be a problem for us, is referred to as glorification. The Apostle Paul speaks about this hope of being fully like Christ in His character one day, and about the fact that He wasn't there yet, in Philippians chapter 3, Verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's the perspective we all need to have. Forgetting those things which are behind, or putting off the old man, and reaching toward those saints which are ahead, or putting on the new man, we need to press toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, using the means of spiritual growth God has provided, and realizing that through these means, God will be working in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. The good news is, our hearts really can be changed.
Let's pray. You know, so often in our lives as believers, we settle for less than we ought to settle for as the children of God. We content ourselves with really mediocre Christian lives. Lives that have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And yet the result of that is that we never experience the kind of abundant life that Jesus said we could experience. We always continue to struggle with the same sin year after year after year. We always find ourselves growing discouraged and disheartened. and We aren't experiencing the life we were created for. And that's on us. It's on us because God just doesn't take some magic wand and zap us and make everything better overnight. But he has provided means of growth. He has provided means of change. And once we come into relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ and begin to regularly and consistently avail ourselves of these means of change, change happens. The problem is with our part in that change. That we're not always working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're tolerating sin in our lives. We're settling for less than we ought to settle for. And so, Father, I pray for all of us in this room that we would work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That we would remember that the very Holy Spirit of God lives within us if we've come to know Jesus. That we would remember that it is your will that we would come to the place where we would obey you, not just outwardly, but from our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to do those things you've asked us to do that can help facilitate change. The change doesn't happen simply because we do these things. Your Holy Spirit is the only agent of change that truly is. But it's through these means that he effectuates change, which means if we don't avail ourselves of these means, then we won't experience the change. Lord, help us to be faithful, to read our Bibles, to go to Bible studies so we can learn more about the Bible, more about your truth. Help us to hang around other believers that are serious about their faith. Help us, Lord, to pray regularly, to share in communion regularly, to worship regularly. Help us, Lord, to step out to serve others. Help us to share the gospel. Help us to stop putting ourselves in tempting situations. Help us to start choosing to do what's right. And Father, I also pray that if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus, this might be the day of salvation. With every head still bowed, maybe you're with us today and you don't yet know if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, but you can certainly understand what I've been talking about in terms of the sin problem, and you certainly understand that there's a need for forgiveness and cleansing and hope in your life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. And the reason that we can only get to God through Jesus is because of our sin problem and the fact that something has to be done about it and the fact that God did something about it in the coming of his son into our world, in the sinless life lived by his son, in the sacrifice made by his son on the cross, in the glorious resurrection of his son. And that is the only means of reconciliation with the holy God. So if you are here today and you're not sure if you've ever truly trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you would raise your hand, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. I'll pray the words aloud. You can repeat them silently to God right where you are. All you need to do is raise your hand. Glorious God, gracious God, merciful God, we come before you today and we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you, Father, for the sufficiency of his sacrifice and for the real forgiveness that we receive when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the new creature that we become when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit whom you give to us when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Father, help us. Help us to live up to our birthright. Help us to be the people you've called us to be. Move in our wills, our minds, our hearts to change us so that not only can our actions be different, that our hearts can be different. Help us, Father, to become the kind of people who do what's right because it's simply in our nature to do what's right. And the kind of people who say no to doing what's wrong because wrong just doesn't make any sense to us anymore and doesn't have any appeal for us anymore. Help us, Lord, become the people that we are capable of becoming through Jesus and through the presence of your Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, to realize that we don't have to settle for less. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would like to know more about us, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.